and so we continue. And uh, church family, um, welcome. I'm going to, before we preach, uh, ask you to join with me in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how often you have used your word to guide and direct, and we ask you to be faithful once again. Accomplish the purpose for which you send this word, and give us the joy of seeing Jesus, our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And again, happy 10-year anniversary, church. Good to celebrate with you with the Aurelios, with the time together. Always a privilege just to share these moments. Uh, from the very get-go, we talked about a love that was for the unlovable. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. What sweet word that is. And welcome again to this place. Well, to get things going, I wanted to ask a question, which is what would you do differently if you knew then what you know now? What would you do differently if you knew then what you know now? Now, mine goes back to my earthly um, childhood days and uh, to these things found in this box. Does anyone know what's in here? These are baseball cards. And I was inspired as a young kid hearing that Mickey Mantle cards were worth like hundreds and thousands if they just had hung on to them. And I was saying to myself, Dad, I'm going to do it better. I'm not going to put those cards in the, the spokes of my bicycle. No, I'm going to keep them. And for me, buying cards, it wasn't just about the top baseball gum. No, it was making an investment, an investment that I thought was going to pay dividends. Oh, but now, now we roll back the time and you go ahead, and, and, and these baseball cards in here are probably worse less than they were then. In fact, I, uh, I had to laugh at one of my buddies' Facebook posts. He said, today I'm making everyone else's cards worth more. These are going to be worth something someday. No, they weren't. What would you do differently if you knew then what you know now? I think of Amazon, if you read the news. They picked their headquarters in New York, Long Island, fell through. I guess Chicago's trying to court them. I'm not sure if we're going to get them, but maybe they would have done things differently. And what about you? What would you have done differently if you knew then what you know now? Would you have still picked that major in college? Anyone would have changed? Would you still have asked him or her out on a date? Would you have bought that car? Would you have bought that house? What might have changed? You know, there is an evolving nature to our earthly wisdom. And because of the evolving nature of earthly wisdom, we have phrases. In fact, I was going to invite you into some uh, congregation participation today. Uh, can you fill in the blank? Hindsight is... All right, um, what about this next one? Nobody has the... This one's a little harder. Neon orange Porsche. No, uh, crystal ball. No one has a crystal ball. And this is my favorite. You don't know what, what you don't know, right? And, and, and we have these phrases because, again, uh, we don't know now what we could have known then. And, and, and that's just the way life works. In fact, I consider on the 10-year anniversary of our church, if we roll back time, do you know when I was assigned to this area from seminary, they were telling me that New Lenox Frankfurt was going to explode like Naperville. In my call packet, they said they were building in New Lenox a mall that would be bigger than the Mall of America. Yeah. That was in my call packet. That they were saying the, the home growth was just going to be exponential. I mean, it was just rapid. It was going gangbusters. And then the Great Recession. And Lincoln Way suffered a little bit, right? Uh, we saw Lincoln Way North close um, because they were building based on the exponential growth projected. And the tagline was the growth projected. It just didn't come. So I wonder, would we even be here if they knew then what we know now? What would they still have chosen to plant in this area in not, in knowing that the growth did not come? Which leads me to my first point, and if you're living in a little bit of regret, here, here's some gospel truth. Sometimes it's beneficial not to know then what we know now. Right? Because in the meantime, we had a chance to share the gospel to so many people. And in the meantime, in your own lives, you might have affected someone. You might have helped someone. You, you, you might have uh, gained some lessons along the way. Maybe it's beneficial not always to know and to have the crystal ball. And I think God's hand is actually in that. So a word of comfort. But what if we could do life a little bit better? And what I really want to talk about is a then we will all face. In the future, without exception, every one of us will be at a then moment. And if we wrap our minds in that then, it can affect what we're doing now in a great way. 
So we're going to turn to the Word of God, and, and yes, we're in this series called Exponential. We want to talk about an exponential difference we can make eternally. Uh, today we're going to learn on the parable of the talents. And let me do just a little bit of teaching. As we explore this story, the master of this story is God. As he entrusts um, to his servants talents, um, what we're going to find is that he has entrusted to us many things. Yes, money, but that's just one thing. Money is, is the direct reference here. He, he's also afforded us talents and abilities and opportunities. And the then moment that we will all face is that when he comes back, he will settle accounts. He will be like a manager saying, I have seen what you did or didn't do with all that I gave you. And I believe if we wrap our minds with that, it again can lead us into what we're doing now. So let's turn to the word in your worship folder, it's recorded, or on the screen. We're going to read the whole section and then unpack it. So here's some verses. It says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. I love that phrase. It stuck out to me. You don't have to live in the comparison trap. God has given you what you have according to what you need according to your ability. It's okay if someone has more or less. Don't be self-conscious. Anyway, then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. And he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time. That struck me because it seems like a long time since God has been gone. In fact, because it's been so long, you might think, well, is he really coming back? But, but it goes on. After a long time, the master of the servants returned, and he settled accounts with him. This is something we will all experience. It's a then we will face without exception. That day is coming, I guarantee it. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man came into the one who received one bag of gold. And here it gets bad. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have been put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, which is where we get this earthly principle of the rich get rich and the poor get poor. In the dichotomy of the faithfulness in the kingdom, this is also a principle that we see being worked. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a picture of hell, which unfortunately is a real place that many people don't like to think of. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. The word of God. That is a then moment that should affect our now activity. Could you just turn to the person sitting next to you and tell them, be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. Are you ready to dig into the word of God? Still with me? Anyone here have the travel bug? Love to escape, love to go places. Anyone with the travel bug? Um, and has anyone ever been out of the United States of America? Traveled abroad? That's a lot of people. Um, for me, that, that's something that I just enjoy loving to dream about, escape to, whether I go there or not. Something that fills my mind. And there are tremendous experiences, tremendous places you can go to. I was looking at some of the world's top hotels. I wanted to share them with you and, and feel free to escape with me in these February moments to places that are a little bit better. Uh, for example, like this place in Singapore. Um, up here is a pool, which I think is like the new standard of infinity pools. Can you imagine being in that pool looking over the city? That'd be a good time. Or then there's this Four Seasons in Budapest, Hungary. 
I wouldn't mind being in a posh place like that. They'd probably call you sir or madam when you go there, correct? But my favorite of all, imagine this place, is Bora Bora, right? And, and I was just thinking how awesome it would be if at, for our anniversary, you know, I could just tell you, and you get a hut, and you get a hut, and you get a hut. We're all going. Now, um, that's not the case. It wasn't in the ministry plan. But we can dream. We can dream. And I actually believe that maybe, just maybe, we don't dream often enough. We don't fill our minds with the good dreams that could be ours, that could spur on the good activity of our days. And in fact, I want to encourage you to dream on. But not just dream about where you're going to be for vacation, but dream what this parable talks about. Now, as we get into the Word of God, it says that, that we will be able to share the master's happiness. And by the way, if you are in Christ, this is yours. Not because of anything you have done, but all because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Won by him as a free gift to you. It was in his ministry plan. Now, with that, what is the master's happiness? <laughs> I just think out of all the things that are sold today, I don't know if you've ever been to a timeshare presentation or the Disney Vacation Club. You know, they, they sell those things big. These things will change your life, which, by the way, they won't change your life. They'll change your bank account, but not your life. Um, but, but out of all the things that are sold to us, what is perhaps the most undersold product in the world is the master's happiness. How is it? Is the devil working? Is the world working? So that we are not thinking about that place. Because consider with me what Scripture says about the master's happiness. It is better than a hut in Bora Bora. In Revelation 21, gave a picture of the New Jerusalem, used wonderful language. It said, it's shown with the glory of God. Its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper clear as crystal. It talked about streets of gold, Yes, the pearly gates, uh, things overlaid with precious stones. Basically, it's going to blow your mind being in that place forever. It's going to be awesome. That's what it looks like. But then think of how we'll feel. Uh, in the master's happiness, this is his plan. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I'm okay with that because as a man, I don't like crying. That's, that's going to be a good day. There will be more, no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Love that. For the old order of things has passed away. And this is yours, and this is mine. Eternally. Now, if you just do the math equation, like divide eternity by 80 years, you start to understand that that will overwhelm our earthly experience. Right? This is just a blip. This is a vapor, a mist. We are not here that long. And so what I encourage you to do is let us dream constantly about our eternal home. Maybe today ask the question, what do you think heaven will be like? For a while, I thought it would be like racing fancy cars in the new heavens and earth where you never get uh, hurt. That, that's my, my, my thought. At another point when I was a young boy, it was just eating donuts all the time, but, but never having the health ramifications. So like you could have like 24 donuts and you're good. I don't know what it is for you, but I think you should dream more often because that's eternal life. It will overwhelm anything we're experiencing right now. In fact, it's not just the pastor who tells you to dream there. Um, this passage also says, set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And if you dream, and if I dream, about what will be ours forever, then I believe it will shape some perception of activity going on here. For example, if we're dreaming about what's coming, it shapes our perception of suffering. Because it means on earth, everything we go through, no matter how bad it is, is both light, it will not be the fatal blow, and it's momentary, overwhelmed by how much longer eternity is. Dreaming there shapes our perception of here. But dreaming there also shapes our perception of what we should do here with the time we have remaining here. In fact, Jesus, he preached famously on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, okay, because that's coming, this is the advice. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. The one who dies with the most toys does not win, they just die. Don't store them up where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. How are we doing with this advice as Americans? 
How are we doing for this personally? I, I was listening to our Access class students about the new trends of what it is to, to get popular items. Um, and, and they brought up these t-shirts. Now, does that look like an impressive t-shirt to you? Me neither. But I guess they're worth like hundreds and thousands of dollars. And if you wear one, you can flex, which, by the way, has nothing to do with your muscles and has everything to do with, like, showing off. So thank you, young ones, for teaching me new things. I'm not cool anymore, and I know that. <laughs> Supreme t-shirts, and they also said ear pods. If you have ear pods, you're, the, you're legit. You're the thing, right? Um, no cords, basically. That's the trend. But I ask you, in 10 years, will that still be the trend? I don't think so. And in eternity, will we care if we were wearing a Supreme t-shirt here? My guess is no. So God goes on, and Jesus says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then we ask, okay, well, if that's the goal, how do I do that? Well, back to the story. See, see the guy in the story, he knew what to do. When he got five, five bags of gold, look, look at what it says. The man who had received them went at once. And I love the urgency because he didn't know how much time he had. And neither do we. Jesus could come back tomorrow and we have work to do. He went at once and he put his money to work. He worked it and it gained five bags more. Now we got to talk a little bit about working it. Uh, To bring this up, I brought another uh, fancy thing. I brought this. Does anyone know what this is for? Someone asked if I was going to demonstrate it and I am not (laughs) going to demonstrate it. This is for your abs. I picked it up at TJ Maxx for like $25, and I was inspired. It was about five years ago, and I've used it about five times. So, you know, that's that's pretty good. And and I guess this would work if I worked it. But I don't know. Do you have any items like this at home? They're, They're more like home ornaments than they are exercise equipment. Like you have a treadmill that is more like hanging the clothes, you know, Um, because you never really use it. I'm always inspired by like the latest trend. It's these bikes right now. Have you seen the commercials? And the commercials make it feel like, you know, Peloton would be fun. Like this isn't even a waste of time. Like I can't wait to be on the bike and sweating, right? Um, Which which is always a thing, and you might have been inspired. But the reality with a $2,500 bike or a $25 ab roller is that they don't work unless you work them, Right? If they're just sitting around, it's, it's not going to be helpful for your physique. It doesn't work unless you work them. Now, where am I going with this? God has given each of us talents and abilities. And, and there's some people in this room who are tremendous with people, just got great people skills. There are other people who are great planners and detail-oriented. There are other people who are great with, with um, like electric, electric work or, or other engineering. And, and, and so many gifts God has just given us. But the reality is, it doesn't work unless you work it. You might have all these talents, you might have all these abilities, but if you don't leverage them for the kingdom, it doesn't make an eternal difference. And so what I tell you is our talents don't work unless we work them. And work them for whom? Because I could use my earthly gifts just to collect more Supreme t-shirts and AirPods. Right? I could do that. But would that make an eternal difference? No. So when it comes to our opportunity, it's to leverage them for the kingdom. To make sure we're using our talents, our abilities, the unique, unique time God has given us to leverage them for the things of God. It doesn't work unless you work them. But I'm also encouraged by how there was a gain. When we get into that verse and it said he worked it and there was gain, I, I was studying and I was like, I was looking for the details over like why there was a gain. I was asking the question like, is there a paradigm of like how he worked so that there was increase? Be- because if there was, I was going to write my new book called Silver Bullet to Building the Kingdom of God. But as you read that verse and as we considered it, did it tell us how there was an increase? No. No, it didn't. It just said he worked and it increased. And I kind of love this because it reminds us of our responsibility as a church 10 years in, as an individual living for God. And another seminary professor, he put it this way when it comes to our responsibility, that God is in the blessing and providing business. We're just in the working and trusting business. To to put it another way, um, we are in charge of the effort. God is in charge of the increase. 
And I love this understanding because it means I don't have to be the brightest and the best. I don't have to have it all figured out to be used by God, and neither do you. In fact, one of the most encouraging stories is probably the feeding of the 5,000. Do you remember this story? Jesus, the master teacher, had been teaching for hours and hours and hours, and he could do that because he was the master teacher. And no one left. They were all there. But they were getting hungry. And Jesus promised his disciples, how are we going to feed them all? And there was one guy who said, hey, Jesus, I got an idea. How about two fish and five loaves? I got a boy's lunch. Now, is that a good idea to feed 5,000 people? It doesn't take much wisdom to figure out that's not going to work. That's a dumb idea. But did the dumb idea stop God from working? No. He took a man's dumb idea, fed everyone, and there were 12 basketfuls afterwards. Now, how does this apply to us? We don't need to have it all figured out, church. Sometimes we have applied wisdom based on evaluation, and that's all good. For example, this last year we did a tremendous soccer camp. I just thank everyone who was a part of that. Had 100 kids there, connected with families, shared Jesus. It was awesome. It was amazing. And then during that week, we also did something that I thought was a little less wise, just a little less impactful. We, we, we did some door hangers, which, you know, if you've ever done, you know, cold calls, you, you, you don't expect much, right? So we did about three hours of door hangers, had 50 hours in the soccer camp. Well, Sunday rolls around, and we have a visitor um, from that week of activity. And does anyone want to guess why that visitor came? Soccer camp or door hangers? Door hangers. So you're saying, God, the three hours of what I thought was maybe dumb activity is what you used to bring them here. Wow. Which leads me to this principle. God can work through something, but it doesn't work through nothing. It doesn't matter what you offer him. It just matters that you offer. That you allow him to use you in whatever way because he can use that. You don't have to have it all figured out. And we don't. In fact, I'm inspired by this verse from 1 Corinthians that just says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now, faithful is different than just being the brightest and the best. It it means that you're persistent, diligent. It means that you don't stop. It means that you're reliable. Now, I'm not against figuring it out. I'm not against having all the right answers. Not against brilliancy. um, But faithfulness is what's required. But there is something that could stop all of our activity. There is something that stands in the way for you and for me to do any of this that I'm talking about. And what stands in the way is our perception of God. A.W. Tozer, a theologian, he said this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The perception of God can influence what we do for God. And when it came to the bad servant, let's focus on him a little bit, what was his perception of God? Well, he tells us. He says, Master, I knew you were a hard man, stern, harsh, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. Basically thought he was cruel, unjust. He he thought this master just wanted to use and abuse him for his own nefarious purposes. So why would he serve such a master? You know, if you've ever thought that about God, he just wants to use and abuse you for his own nefarious purposes, it may affect how well you serve. In fact, uh, 10 years in, I I look at the state of Christianity in America, and is it getting better or worse? Probably worse. And I think part of the crisis is the perception of God. In fact, if you've come today And let's say that you have a perception of God only influenced by a Netflix show. That's your perception of God. Or Christianity. Or if you have the perception of God or Christianity based on what news media will release about God or Christianity. If you have a perception of God based on TV shows, like I heard of this new one, I haven't seen it, Miracle Workers, where Steve Buscemi is God. In what world is Steve Buscemi God? If that is your perception of God shaped, I I think you might have a perception of God problem. Because let me inform you about the reality of God. The truth is, he's more brilliant than any diamond. 
every facet, every characteristic would wow you. In fact, when, when it comes to God and what he's done for us, what this servant said, it is only true if it were opposite day. You ever play opposite day with the kids? You say something, oh, it's opposite day. You mean the exact different. Because, because the reality is in Jesus Christ, you and I, we reap what we have not sown. That's the good news. In Romans 5, it says this, through the obedience of the one man who happens to be Jesus, the many us will be made righteous. We will reap something that we never sowed. And then we consider, how is God? Is he harsh? Is he cruel? Is he mean? Have you seen Jesus? Yes, God, he, he wanted punishment over sin. But the sacrifice God demanded is the sacrifice he himself fulfilled through his son so that we could be set free, not getting anything we deserved. God has loved the unlovable, us, when we had nothing to offer him. In fact, if you're wrestling with your perception of God, you only need really one passage to change your mainframe. It's John 3.16, which says, God so, can you say that word? God so that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he has eternal life. And if you're new to Christianity, you're new to this place, I just need to convince you, he loves you more than you know right now. He died to know you. When you had nothing, he gave you everything so that you could reap what you didn't sow. This is the message we've proclaimed for 10 years, that Jesus is the chief cornerstone of this church. And it is this message that has inspired the faithful activity of his people. Now, I was going to spend some time just trying to recount everyone's faithful service. And then after writing about four paragraphs of names and activity, um, I was like, I'm going to still leave someone out. But I want to tell you, if you have served the Lord faithfully from the heart, he has seen it, he knows, and it's worth it. He has seen it, he knows, and it is worth it. Every effort that you have given, he collects. He's, he's watching you kind of like a, a father watching a son who has given an assignment. He knows what you have done. And because of this, I wanted to end today giving you an encouraging word. To set this up, I want to talk a little bit about the rise of an NFL coach named Sean McVay. Have you heard of this guy? Anyone guess how old he is? 33 years old. Now, I will not ask if you are older than that, but that is young. 33 years old to have one of the most prestigious jobs in all of sports. But a little bit of how he got there. In 2008, he was a wide receiver's assistant coach in Tampa Bay. Not a big gig. Then he went to the Redskins. He proved himself there was the tight ends coach, so not an assistant. Proved himself there. Then he became offensive coordinator at the Redskins. And then finally, after proving himself there, he was in the Super Bowl, proving himself as one of the youngest coaches to be a pretty good dude. Now, how did he get there? He was faithful with a little, so he was given a little bit more. Faithful with more, so he was given more, faithful with more, and so he's given this big platform to coach on. Now, if this applied to children, uh, let's use this analogy. If children, if you clean your room, you know, the, the parents, they might ask you to, to, to help with the kitchen. And then if you help with the kitchen and clean your room, they might ask you to, to clean the whole house. And some of you are like, Pastor, are you trying to tell me not to do my chores? But, but, but no, what I'm trying to say is that, that if you prove yourself faithful, you might be given more opportunity in a great way. And that's, that's what this parable talks about. The master said to the one given five and two, it said, you have been faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Dear church family, I have seen your faithfulness. We have been reaching the lost and the Lord has blessed it. But don't be surprised as you faithfully serve, he gives you more and more opportunities to do just that. And what a great thing that would be. But I think maybe most important, because I have an eternal perspective and I told you to dream about that heavenly home, is where are the many things? So the few things, was that earth or heaven? That was earth. He has come back. Where are the many things that he's being given and trusted to? Heaven. Heaven. 
which means what you do now affects your eternity then. And I would wager that all the activity then to be faithful now, if that affects my then, is worthwhile. I would wager that all our labor for the Lord that we put in now, if it's going to expect my spot, if maybe now I get a hut because I was so faithful, I don't know, it's all going to be good. But anyway, maybe it's worth it to not give up, but to continue to faithfully labor for the Lord who has labored for us. Church, that's our opportunity for the next 10 years and beyond. May we not give up, but consider it worthy to serve the one who sowed so we could reap, to serve the one who is our unending, never-failing, gracious, and good God. May God so bless us. Amen. Please stand.